Money on ID. May 6, 2013. And the gritty heartland city of Cleveland is about to witness a miracle. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and I'm, I'm here, I'm free now. Amanda Berry, abducted just a day before her 17th birthday. But she'd not escaped love. Two other young women found that day. Gina Jesus returns here. She is indeed home. Gina De Jesus kidnapped at the age of 14, and Michelle Knight, never even known to be missing. The man police arrested who owns the home is their abductor, a deranged school bus driver named Ariel Castro. But through the years of their captivity, they held on to one conviction that their families would never give up on them. Ten years later, that faith brought them home. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It was a story that seemed impossible to comprehend. How Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight survived being trapped in a nightmare for so many years. Then, in 2015, Amanda and Gina finally told their story in a book and shared their experiences, from capture to imprisonment to the moment they knew freedom was finally in their grasp with Robin Roberts. And the message they sent was loud and clear. The story in their book begins this way. Now we want the world to know. We survived. We love life. We, we were strong to know your passion. You're about to go on an amazing journey of resilience, celebration, and faith. Until tonight, it's been a mystery what really went on in that house for an unimaginable 10 years. But for the first time right here, you're gonna hear that incredible story. Amanda Berry and Gina De Jesus share it in their new book, Hope, a memoir of survival in Cleveland. And they prove that out of the darkest depths of humanity, a light still shines. That's pretty cool. Amanda Berry, now 29, is tiny, just over five feet tall, but inside, a tower of strength. Tell me what you were like when you were 13. What kind of teenager were you then? I was pretty much a homebody. I stayed home a lot, you know, did my schoolwork. What did you want to be when you grew up? I was into fashion. Like, when I was in school, I, like, the shoes had to match the shirt and the shoelaces had to match the outfit, you know? She was raised by her mother and old sister in a working class neighborhood on the city's west side. The tiny girl had big dreams of being the first in her family to go to college. We was a very close family. It was me, my mom, my sister, and my two daughters. We did everything together. There was not a time that she didn't call and let us know where she was. It is April 21st, 2003, the day before her 17th birthday, and Amanda is on her way to work at Burger King. How did that day begin? Well, my mom gave me a kiss and just tell me have a good day. And I got up, got ready for work. I almost called off of work that day because the next day was my birthday. You know, what if, what if I would have caught off that day? That question would haunt her in years to come. But this day begins like any other until the moment when an SUV starts to follow her down the street. And he asked, do you need a ride home? And I said, I said, yes. The man inside is the father of her friend, Angie Castro, from middle school. So did that make you feel a little relieved? It did, yeah. You know, it's a friend's dad. He's like, well, she's at my house. Would you like to go see her? I said, yeah, sure. I haven't seen her in a while. They drove down this quiet street, Seymour Avenue, and pull up in front of a white two-storied house. And what happened when you went into the house? Well, he said, oh, well, the bathroom door's closed. Maybe I think maybe she's taking a bath. So he said, well, just wait. Um, so he started showing me around the house. And I never got back out. Moments after stepping through the door, Amanda knows she is in trouble. Castro takes her upstairs and shows her something strange, a mystery woman sleeping in a bedroom in front of a television set. When I seen her, it was like a little peephole that like the door not was supposed to go in. So that's all I saw. It. She would later learn that woman, 22-year-old Michelle Knight, been Castro's prisoner for almost a year. And did he tell you that that was his roommate? Her memories of what happened next 
are still raw. And he took me to the next bedroom, and it was just really dark in there, and he didn't turn on the lights. And there was a little room off of the bigger bedroom, kind of a big closet. And he took me in there, and he um told me to pull down my pants. From there, I knew, like, this was not going to be good. Amanda has just become Castro's second prisoner. When he took me to the basement, he taped my wrist and he, he taped my... He taped my ankles. And he put um, a belt around my ankles over the tape. And then he put a helmet over my head. And he said, just be quiet and don't make any noise and I'll take you home. The visor of that black helmet is now fogged by her tears. He chained me up to this pole and it was like a really thick chain, like a motor chain or something. And he just left me there. He put, he shut the lights off and put a little TV there and I was just left in the dark. I just started screaming and crying and somebody please help me, you know? And, Nobody, nobody came. So you're there in the dark, you're chained up. Lord only knows what you had to be thinking. I was so scared that I was gonna die. I didn't think that I was gonna ever make it home. Just a 10 minute drive away, her sister Beth is worrying about why Amanda never came home. So her mother calls the police. We left her a message. Um, by the third phone call with no answer, we knew something was wrong because 90% of the time she's going to answer that phone. The neighborhood around Amanda's home becomes ground zero for the investigation. FBI Special Agent Tim Kalanick, head of the Violent Crimes Unit, knows that the road ahead is far from easy. Missing person cases are probably the most difficult cases that we work. And the reason is, is because it really is a needle on a haystack. You're looking for that piece of evidence. You know, some unusual person walking down the street, an unusual vehicle. Amanda was last seen leaving work at this Burger King on Lorraine Avenue. All across the city, the news of her abduction makes headlines as a search for the missing teenager begins. Her sister is posting Amanda's picture. She hopes for the best. And in that White House on Seymour Avenue, Amanda is watching her mother, her sister, her own story slowly unfold in the bitter grays of a tiny black and white TV. Um, keep her going on the news media, any flyers I can do. I wanted her to know that we was fighting for her and we wasn't going to give up until we knew where she was or what had happened. What went through your mind when you were watching that as you were chained? That kept me going. And I said, you know, I'm going to make it home to you. As long as you fight, I'm going to fight. It is day four of Amanda's abduction. Castro has moved her to an upstairs bedroom, chaining her to a radiator. The hours are crawling by. The loneliness, the, the isolation, Amanda, that you must have, have felt. How did you deal with that? Um, well, the first week I was there, it was really tough. So I asked for maybe a coloring book and something I can write in a journal or something. The first thing he gives her is a diary with a tiny lock and key. Her first entry, written by the flickering light of the television. I just can't wait to go home. I'm 17 now, but don't have a life. But he told me I'm young and I will go home before summer, another two months. It would be 10 years before she would return home. When we come back, Amanda's private diary, her secret code to trap him, next. Two years after her escape, Amanda Berry was ready to finally tell what happened in the 10 years she was held captive in a rundown house on Cleveland's west side. Robin Roberts picks up the story as the shock of the first days gives way to a routine that is more horrific than anyone could imagine. This is a scale model of Ariel Castro's house, 1,400 square feet four bedrooms and one bathroom. Amanda was first held captive down in the basement 
then moved to the second floor and chained in the main bedroom. Just steps down the hall, Michelle Knight, Castro's first captive, lived in a second tiny bedroom. On the surface, the house didn't draw a second glance, but concealed inside 2207 Seymour Avenue is a bunker of chilling magnitude. There were doors that were put on the windows, um, completely covering the windows so no light could come in. The bolts that held those doors on the wall were sheared off. There was no way they could get them, and those were even behind plexiglass. Its owner, Ariel Castro, is five feet seven inches tall and a recluse. His only known hobby, playing weekend gigs at local jazz clubs. On the outside, he appeared very normal. He was a bus driver, and there was an instance where he took the grill out in the front yard, and he invited his neighbors. He might be the last one he would suspect of wrongdoing. But the school bus driver is a man with a past. He has a former wife, four children, and a history of brutal violence. She and her children moved out of the house, fleeing Castro's violent rage. He hated women. He beat his wife so badly, he stomped on her head, he broke her teeth, he broke her bones. From the beginning, a man that could sense the uncontrollable anger within. He was very intimidating. He was very scary. His voice was mean and like deep. And if you ever looked into his eyes, they were like black, like he had no soul. It is April 27th, 2003. Six days into captivity, and Amanda is still chained to that radiator in the second floor bedroom. My chain is actually a few different chains linked by padlocks. It stretches five feet from the radiator to my stomach. Five feet has become the size of my whole world. Can you describe what it was like to live chained like that? It was really hard going to sleep at night. You know, if you wanted to toss onto your back, you couldn't do that. You would have to take the whole chain and move it to the front of your stomach so that you're not laying on the big lock on your back. Her tiny room, about the size of a closet, is dark and filthy. The mattress was old and nasty. It was just disgusting and the buckets he used the bathroom that smelled horrible once a day he feeds her sometimes junk food sometimes not at all he started to give a bag of chips or crackers or something her access to the bathroom is strictly limited he could only take a bath like once a week you know my hair would get so tangled and i would try to brush it out with my hands and i just it just got nasty being so dirty Ariel Castro is her only lifeline, but everything, even her weekly shower, comes at a price. He tried to act nice, but he's like, well, maybe you need to go take a shower, and he, I had to take a shower with him. He forced you to take a shower with him? He thought that, well, I gave, I gave her that. I deserve this. Well, what do you want to tell people about the sexual abuse that you suffered? It was horrible. After a while, you just get used to it. Like, you, like, numb yourself to it, and you, like, put your mind somewhere else so that you're not there, you know? You're not in that room with him. How often did you think you were not going to survive? Oh, there was plenty of times when I just never knew if, why is he keeping me here? Is it, you know, one day when he's done with me, he, you know, he'll kill me and get rid of me. Yet, what Amanda now knows of Castro's brutality strengthens her conviction to survive. I realize I have a mission. This man enjoys hurting women, and I want people to know it. I don't want him to get away with it. I need to outlast him. She keeps a record in code in her diary. Hidden testimony against Ariel Castro. One X, three, four. Each entry, a daily record of rape you would actually put how many times he was assaulting you? I would always write these numbers at the top of the pages because I felt like, you know, one day, maybe authorities will get to read it and he'll be punished for what he did. She's disturbed that Castro calls her his temporary wife. He would try to hold hands with me. It would just make me sick because he would fall asleep and so I would like, take my hand away from his hand and I would like scoot to the very edge of the bed but I couldn't go too far because of the chain. Amanda has been missing for a week when her family receives a late night call. It is Castro taunting them using Amanda's cell phone. He called and said, I have Mandy, which nobody called her Mandy, but who knew her? 
she wants to be with me, we're married. Well, we kind of just sat there like, we know she's not married. We knew definitely that it was foul play. Making that call on Amanda's phone was a near miss in the case, leading authorities to within two blocks of his house. In 2003, the FBI was just starting to develop technology that could track a cell phone's location. The intelligence and the information we have indicated that Amanda's phone was used in about a 30, 40 block area. We spent about a week around the clock in that area, hoping that this phone would be used again. But Castro didn't use that phone again, and their one solid lead vanished into thin air. There were very good tips, very good leads that, that we had to follow up on, and we did follow up on. But unfortunately, the tip that we need just, just didn't come in. The weeks are slowly stretching into months when Castro makes Amanda a strange promise. He would always tell me when he got another girl in the house that, you know, I'm just looking for this another girl and then I'll take you home. But Amanda knows he's lying to her. She's seen Michelle Knight locked in another room. Though they've never spoken, she knows Michelle is a prisoner too. It was scary because I didn't know if one day we were going to be murdered. When he felt like he was done or he wanted more girls in the house, like what was he going to do to us? As the months pass by, Amanda's mother is fighting to hold on to hope. Her daughter's room unchanged since her disappearance. Amanda's Christmas presents still unopened. Four miles away, in the freezing cold of her room, Amanda fills the empty hours by writing in a diary, hundreds of pages, in notebooks, on napkins, and even on fast food bags. So you'd get a bag like this, you'd bring back something home, what would you do with it? It would just go all the way around. There we go. Voila. There's your paper. How many days could you get into this? Oh, uh, that could last a good week if you needed it to. Amanda has been a prisoner for almost a year when Castro goes on the prowl again, hunting just five blocks away from the street where he kidnapped Amanda. On this day, the young girl who catches his eye is 14. Her name, Gina De Jesus, and she's one of his daughter's closest friends. He pulls over to me and then he got in the car and then he would say he's gonna turn around, but he never turned around. Gina De Jesus is about to become Castro's third victim. Stay with us. Amanda Berry has been held captive for almost a year. Now, Ariel Castro is hunting for another teenage girl to abduct. And he doesn't have to look far. Once again, here's Robin Roberts. Her spirit is in her smile. Gina De Jesus, age 14, the baby of the family. She loves to dance. I like you. <laughs> now 25, she still has the sweetness of the 14-year-old girl she once was. What are words that describe what kind of 14-year-old you were? Outgoing. I like to go outside and hang out with my friends, go skating. What dreams did you have for yourself? I wanted to become a lawyer. Why? I don't know, I think it was fun to win cases. <laughs> Gina grew up on the rough side of a hard town. The youngest child of three, she was a slow learner in special education classes. And from an early age, her mother, Nancy Ruiz, always taught her to be wary of strangers. I told her, like if somebody came up to you and tell you, you know, can you help me look for my dog? I lost my dog. Don't stop. You continue to walk in, you ignore the person. I told her to be aware of her surroundings at all times. But all of Nancy's planning was no match for a predator like Ariel Castro. Tell us about that day you were with his daughter. Yes, Arlene Castro. Did you have any idea what kind of man he was? No. I just knew, I just knew that that was her father, and my dad was friends with him. Gina is heading home from school with her friend Arlene and gets her some of her bus money to phone home. We were talking about what we wanted to do because it was Friday. And then I was like, you need to come over. And then she asked her mom, and her mom says no. She went the other way, and then I went the other way. Now short on bus fare, Gina starts the long walk home. When suddenly that maroon SUV pulls up at the curb, it's Arlene's father. He asks me um, if 
you've seen my daughter? I said, yeah, she's right around the corner. And he was like, can you help me find her? And I said, sure. When they arrive at the house, he invites her in. I was sitting there and he's like, starts like, to like touch me and stuff. And then <clears throat> I'm like, what are you doing? You can go to jail. And then he just switches up like, well, okay, we're gonna, you're gonna go home now. He said, but you can't go through the same door you came in. He leads Gina down into his basement, then grabs her and begins to chain her. He didn't make it tight enough. So I threw it over and then I tried to run, but he sat on my back. And then I just start kicking him. I'm, I kicked him and I bruised him really bad. As Castro overpowers the tiny girl, she starts screaming for help. Nobody could hear me. The radio was too loud. He always had that radio up so the neighbors could hear. He had like two radios up. He had one in the basement and one in the living room. What were you feeling in those initial moments that when you're in that basement for the first time and he leaves you there chained like that? I was, why is this happening? Why can't nobody hear me when I'm screaming? Help was only two miles away if Gina's parents only knew where to start. I went searching everywhere, downstairs, schools, empty buildings. The police feverishly searched for clues, now suspecting that there is a serial criminal on the loose. By air, on ground, every inch of Cleveland's west side under the microscope. For the first few weeks, Gina is traumatized by Castro's disturbing behavior. He would take my hair and, and like put it in his mouth. I don't know why he did it, but it was gross. When was the first time that he took advantage of you? May 7th. She still remembers the exact date, but it's still too painful to say more. What are you comfortable in sharing and telling us about that? I'm not comfortable. During her first few days in captivity, Gina watches stories about her own kidnapping and begins to suspect that she is not Castro's first victim. I kept watching the news after a while. You would hope that Amanda Berry will soon come home. I was like, did you take Amanda? And he was like, no, why would you think that? I was like, because um, you took me. One month later, he admits the truth, allowing the girls to meet for the first time while watching their families on America's Most Wanted. I called in friends after friends. They said they did not see it. So what was your initial feeling that Oh my goodness, there's two others that I'm not the only one in here. He's got three of us. There's something wrong with this man. With three women now in prison in the house, each in separate rooms, Castro seemed to be creating a strange polygamous version of his ideal family. What was the relationship like with you and him? I couldn't stand him, but I couldn't like show it all the time. I had to act like I, li I liked him. And we were friends, but I really didn't like him. He deluded himself into thinking that he was leading a normal life with these women. He was providing for them. They had a little family, which is crazy, but that's the way he thought. At first, Gina is Castro's new favorite. He seems to treat me better than the other girls. I have the nicer room. He lets me eat first. I wonder if he's kinder to me because I'm the new girl. And I wonder what happens when I'm not new anymore. As the new girl, Gina learns about Castro's rigid house rules, granting them freedom from their chains only to clean the house. We had to make toothpaste last for like five months. We had to use like a tiny drop of dish soap to wash like a full sink of dishes. We had to put the pan in the center on the stove. Like it couldn't be a little to the left, a little to the right. Castro used this calculated deprivation to drive the girls apart. When you have very little, you can become jealous. Yeah. What were you jealous of? It could be from getting more food, less food, different clothes. I mean, it was just simple things. But when you don't have anything, you're like, well, why don't I have that? I want that. The girls were riding an emotional roller coaster when suddenly Amanda drops a bombshell. She writes about it in her diary. I have a secret, no reason to fight. I think I'm pregnant. When we come back. Three 
more years have passed in that house on Seymour Avenue, Gina, Amanda, and Michelle locked in a prison of frozen time. Their posters are getting tattered. Their school friends have graduated. Years of isolation have left the girls with nothing but the past. I never finished high school or learned to drive. I hate him for selling me off from the world. What was the biggest part of you that you felt he took from you that you lost? Um, a normal life, living life. As a normal teenage girl, having birthdays or going to a prom, having the fun times as just a regular teenager. Still, they hold fast to the memories of their family's love. Ironically, Castro gives the girls this stencil. They trace the word hope to ward off despair. I got that when he went to the yard sale, and I thought it was so random. What did it mean to you? It, it gave me hope to come home one day. Their only window to the outside world is that black and white television. Anybody that you watched on television that helped you get through the times? I watched Oprah a lot. Martha Stewart for recipes. And I watched you. You watched me? I remember during Hurricane Katrina, I saw everything that you went through. Robin Roberts is live. My family had barely survived the hurricane's so, devastation. Hey, sisters, okay? They're all right. And the house? I gotta say, man, are you saying that? It reaffirms to you that you never know who's watching. You never do. And Amanda is watching when her mother appears on the Montel Williams show with psychic mm. Sylvia Brown. I would watch her every time she was on Montel, and I'd say, I wish my mom would go on there. And then she could tell my mom that I was alive and that I'm okay. Jeez. But Sylvia Brown breaks Luana's hope. I just hate that she's not alive. I, mean. I just broke down crying because I couldn't believe she said that. And then my mom broke down crying, so that hurt even worse. Two years later, Amanda learns on a news report that her mother has passed. For three years, Luana Miller fought hard to find Amanda. I think that was the hardest part of being in there. She was always fighting and she was never gonna give up on me. And for her to get sick and I couldn't be there with her. I couldn't help her when she was sick. Isolated by loss, sometimes Amanda has only Castro. So he came in the room and I was just really sad and I started talking to him and he's like, everything's gonna be okay. Everything's gonna turn out all right. And so I asked him for a hug, and we hugged. There had to be a part of you that was thinking, what in the world? There was, but then there was another part of me like, I, I needed that. I needed like a human caring touch instead of everything that he always did, which was not caring. It is Amanda's 20th birthday when Hope makes an unexpected visit. I think I'm pregnant. I think my mom sent this baby. Someone helped pull me through. I think to send me a mural. When you first realized that you were pregnant, what went through your mind? Um, I was terrified. I mean, I barely eat, and I'm chained to a wall, and I have a bucket for a bathroom. It is early in the morning on Christmas Day, 2006, and Amanda Berry is in labor. He went and got Michelle, and he got this baby pool because he didn't want, you know, a mess on the bed, so... She strips off her clothes and gets into that inflatable waiting pool. Michelle was kind of just talking to me, like, you know, relax, calm down, you're okay. And he sat in the rocking chair right there, just reading this book about, like, birth and stuff. Just hours later, baby Jocelyn emerges into her surreal world. What was it like for you, Amanda, when you looked in her eyes for the first time? It was amazing, because she was so quiet, and she was just the most beautiful thing. <laughs> you hear of rape victims who have a child. How do you just wrap your mind around it and make it work? You know, at first, that's what I was worried about. This is his kid. You know, how do I feel about that? And, she resembled him a lot, and I would look at her, and I just felt like, she's mine. She's mine. <laughs> at first, Castro's so afraid of raising questions, he buys no supplies for the baby. 
her first outfit was one of his socks and he cut out like two holes for her legs and then he cut out another sock and then he cut two arms out and it was like a little dress for her. From day one of Jocelyn's life, Amanda fights for normal in the most abnormal of places. She covers the doors over her windows with a bright shower curtain. She pastes the alphabet up on a wall. But as Jocelyn grows older, it gets harder to hide the truth. Does she see the chains on you? Yeah. So he started to call them like bracelets. And she was about three years old. And he finally took the chains off. That was because of Jocelyn. What was her relationship like with her father? Normal. She loved him and he loved her. Did you ever worry that he was going to harm her? I was. Would he touch her? Would he ever think about touching her? Because, you know, he had his problems. Despite those fears, she says Castro is a good father. Though Jocelyn is almost three before he consents to her first walk outside in the sun. She had never been to parks before and seen little kids like herself. One of the best times when you looked out and you saw the sunlight on her face for the first time. It was the most beautiful thing. I just felt like that's, that's where she should always be. It's the beginning of a new chapter in Jocelyn's life, going outside, attending Sunday services. Her room is now filled with toys. Castro's love for Jocelyn is turning him into a different man. He really didn't know what to do because this adorable little girl saying, I want to go outside and see the ice cream man. I want to go and see the snow. And the more she led him outside, kind of the more likely it was that his jail was going to one day burst apart. It is the summer of 2011. Jocelyn is almost five years old when, in a defiant act of hope, Amanda creates an imaginary schoolhouse inside the prison of their tiny room. We would pretend, leave our house, all of this in the same room, of course. So you've been doing all this in the same room? Yeah. Um, I would tell her, okay, we're at a street now, so you gotta stop. And then you look both ways for cars, and then we can go across the street. Okay, we're at school now. So and then I'd sit her at her little desk and tell her, you have a good day at school now, Mommy. I'll be back later for you. They would travel together on that imaginary journey every day of Jocelyn's kindergarten year. When we come back, how they nearly escaped. His daughter was right there, 10 feet away. You can think about if we yell. Next. Though the house was a fortress and the girls, for years, locked and chained, the question that many may ask is, why didn't they run? I thought about putting rat poison in his, his beans and then spraying like pine salt in his eyes, but, but he was always a step ahead of what I was doing. Both girls admit there were opportunities that slipped away. Once, when Gina's friend Arlene Castro stopped by, he moved and chained all three girls in the basement. The three of you were in the basement and his daughter was right there. Arlene was just 10 feet away. Yeah, we can hear him laughing and talking. Still, they remained silent. Did you think about if we yell? She's right there, we're right there. Possibly somebody could, she could hear you? There was always a chance, what if he killed everybody? The daily abuse was agonizing, but the unknown, even more terrifying. Every day was unpredictable. That was one of the hardest parts, because you never knew how he was going to act. What do you say to those people to make them understand? You never know until you're in that situation, what you're going to do, how you're going to react. They dreamt of, of escaping. They dreamt of setting the house on fire. But if I get caught, I just can't bear any more pain. And it was, it just, they were frozen in fear. But on May 6, 2013, courage came from the most unexpected of places. On that day, it is little Jocelyn who sparks the great escape. Jocelyn goes downstairs and then she runs back up and she says, 
I don't find daddy, daddy's nowhere around. It's like, mom, daddy's car is gone. My heart immediately started pounding because I'm like, should I chance it? If I'm gonna do it, I need to do it now. Amazingly, she finds her bedroom door unlocked. This is the one time that your room was not locked. Never before in 10 years has that happened. She races downstairs. The front door is open, but beyond it, a second door padlocked shut. Still, Amanda manages to squeeze out an arm. So I'm just like waving my arm and I'm like, somebody please, please help me. I'm Amanda Berry, please. She's too afraid to go back for Gina and Michelle. I turned to Michelle, I'm like, we could run. But then once Michelle gets pumped, I talked her out of it. Why'd you talk her out of it? I thought that, that Amanda got caught. Outside, a neighbor sees Amanda, but is afraid to intervene. After I got to that door and the guy didn't help me, I was like, he's gonna come home and this is just gonna be the end. That's when Charles Ramsey shows up. I see this girl going nuts, trying to get out of her house. I go on the porch and she says, help me get out. I've been, I'm, I've been in here a long time. He kind of like started like trying to pull on the door, but he, he couldn't get it open either. And so he like kind of kicks it and he's like, there you go, finish kicking it out and you can get out. With reckless courage, Amanda kicks her way to freedom and emerges, clinging to her terrified daughter. This is a cell phone image of that moment of freedom. And she comes out with a little girl and she says, call 911. My name is Amanda Berry. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and I'm, I'm here, I'm free now. Were you still frightened that he may show up at any time i was terrified and just because there's people on the street doesn't mean that he's he wouldn't hurt me why after all this time do you think he left that door open i still don't know why he left that day with the door unlocked i will never know within minutes the police start flooding the street it was so unreal because the cops just kept coming my partner immediately asked her you know is there anybody else inside uh, and she said, yes, Gina De Jesus and another girl. A neighbor captures the moment when the police storm the house. Inside, Gina and Michelle cower in their room, afraid of Castro's rage. And I'm like, oh, we're next. He's coming for us, so close the door. They yell police, and then Michelle swings the door open and just runs out there and hugs him. She jumped on to me. She's like, you saved us, you saved us. I'm holding on to her so tight. In tears, Officer Anthony Espada looks up and sees Gina, unrecognizable after losing 30 pounds. I just look at her I, and I asked her, what, what's your name? She said, my name is Georgina De Jesus. We found them. We found them. Lost and finally found, the flashing lights blind their eyes, accustomed only to darkness. Once I saw that, I'm like, you know, this is it. I think we're free now. <laughs> Delivered at last from the shadows, their families wait with open arms. Oh my God, she's so skinny, but she was still beautiful. She had the biggest smile that she always had. What's it like to me? I need somebody to wake me up. Thank you, Lord. You brought my baby back home. For Amanda, Gina, and Michelle, the endless nights of terror have finally come to an end. August 1st, 2013, Ariel Castro pleads guilty to 937 counts of kidnapping and rape. His sentence, life plus 1,000 years. But can Gina and Amanda forgive the man who stole their lives away? I think you have to forgive in order to move on with your life. Can you forgive him? You know, I thought about that a lot. And in this situation, I feel like, no, I could never forgive him. I mean, he took my mom from me. I'll never get to see her again. Just weeks into his sentence, Castro hanged himself. I wish he would have not killed himself because I wanted him to suffer like we did. I think he took the easy way out. The house on Seymour Avenue yeah! has been demolished, torn down by the state to prevent it from becoming a morbid curiosity. 
It took less than one hour to erase a 10-year-old nightmare. You cried. I think it was like tears of happiness. Everything bad that happened in that house, now it's gone. Mm -hmm. One Please. hopeful item from those dark years, a thank you note, now seems prophetic. So like one day I was going to get home and they were going to read this. Thank you for not giving up on me. And it's because of your help that you're reading this, because that means I'm home. <laughs> I think this is in part what brought you home. To Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight, three extraordinary women. And what about Michelle Knight, the third woman imprisoned in that house? We don't really keep in touch, but I just wish her the best. For Amanda and Gina, survival has sweetened the taste of freedom. And how's your life now? It's great. I can walk outside when I want. I can take my daughter to school. I can go to my friend's house. I can eat what I want. <laughs> I'm going to school now. Have you learned how to drive yet? Yes, I have my license. I hope my daughter, she does good in school. And we just have a bright future and see what comes. With the past now behind them, one last note. To the thousands of missing children out there, watching, searching, as Gina and Amanda did, for a light in the darkness. And you don't know who's watching you right now when we air this. What do you say to that person who's watching you right now? Amanda looks straight into the camera with this message of hope. Never give up, because you will make it. Your family, your friends will not give up, so you don't give up. Two years after their escape, another milestone for Amanda Berry and Gina De Jesus. Both women received honorary degrees from John Marshall High School in Cleveland, the school Amanda was attending when Ariel Castro abducted her. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.